Remember when I said in my previous video there were more interesting tombs to be found here? Well, this one definitely stands on top of that list. Welcome to the catacombs of Qom el Shokafa, probably the most famous catacombs in the city. Being rediscovered in 1900 when a donkey accidentally fell into the access shaft. Ouch! To date, Three sarcophagi have been found, along with other human and animal remains, which were added later. If there are tourists around the city, chances are they are heading this way. It's famous for its beautiful mix of art and culture, both Egyptian, Greek and Roman, not found in any other catacomb in the ancient world. The name Com el Shokafa itself is derived from the ancient Greek, translating to Mount of Sharks, as there were piles of pottery here, used for drinking and eating on by those who came to visit the tombs. Afterwards, the visitors would shatter them and leave them behind in piles since it was considered bad luck to take used pots out of the tomb. It's believed construction was started in the 2nd century AD and was used to intern the dead for the next 200 years. Again, it's a nice and spacious site with much to see, including smaller mausoleums. Again, it's not allowed to take pictures inside the catacombs, but outside it was allowed. But be sure to ask before you take pictures. The main site, of course, is the spiral staircase into the catacombs. It goes around a shaft which was used to lower the bodies into the catacombs. According to archaeologists, it was started as a tomb for a single wealthy Romanized Egyptian family, but was expanded into a larger burial site for unknown reasons. Now, the wealthy were buried in a typical sarcophagus, but for the less well-off, niches were cut into the walls to place all the bodies. Since they have to keep making new niches, they had to keep cutting into the rock and now you have these long corridors which are very impressive and seems to go on. So don't get lost. Some of the niches were more shallow though and were used to put a hydra jar which held the ashes of those who were cremated. On your way down, you even pass a room that has seats carved into the stone where visitors could rest. Apparently it was very exhausting going down. Now, the original main part of the tomb is decorated much like a Greek temple. At the bottom of the steps is the proneus or porch of the temple set between two columns. Inside, you find the combination of art for which it is famous. For example, on either side of the doorway there are two serpents carved into the relief to guard the tomb. They represent a Greek Agatha demon, which is a good spirit apparently. But the Greek serpents are wearing a traditional Egyptian double crown. However, they carry both a Roman and a Greek staff. Above the serpent's head are Greek shields carrying the image of Medusa, who was placed in it to ward off unfriendly intruders. Further inside, there are scenes showing Egyptian gods and priests offering sacrifices to the deceased. A tip, come here very early, so you can really enjoy the art. When I arrived here, there were already groups of tourists arriving by bus and listening to their guides. So I rushed down to enjoy the catacombs before they came down. So now the hordes are all down there. The staircase is really not meant for two-way traffic. We can now enjoy the site above ground in peace.
And welcome to our last big site of today, guys. Kudos to you for hanging in. This site is called Com El Daka, which apparently means Hill of Rubble or the Hill of the Benches. Apparently, in the end of the 19th century, many piles of rubble and sand lay here. And these piles apparently look like huge benches. So, again, much to see here besides the obvious beautiful little theater down there. On the left, you can find the open-air museum, including items found all over the city. Even items that were brought up from the Grand Harbor underwater site. As I mentioned before, the city had earthquakes in the past, and even a massive tsunami in 365 AD. Many statues, buildings and even whole cities, such as Heraklion, are now underwater. Any items brought above the surface are at risk of such heavy damage being suddenly exposed again to the air they are brought here. In these tubs, a special bath is prepared for these items with chemicals. Not only to clean them, it makes them strong enough to stay intact as well. But it's a difficult and probably very expensive process, so much is still underwater. But you can still see many items here that have been brought up to see the light of day once again. Besides the theater, there are also Roman baths and a whole residential quarter dating from the Ptolemaic till the medieval period. Near the theater, you can find cisterns, a gymnasium and ancient Roman streets, along with a large villa dating to the reign of Hadrian that is now called the Villa of the Birds. 
Across the theater, a new stage has been erected, so that the Roman theater can be used as a backdrop to modern theater productions, lectures and other performances, mostly by the Opera House. So now let's see the main point of interest. The amphitheater. It was discovered by coincidence in the year 1960, when a group of workers went to remove a pile of dust and sand to clear the land for a construction site. They found some solid iron columns indicating that something may be buried here. The Roman amphitheater we see today was constructed in the 4th century AD and stayed in service to host different artistic events like musical concerts and different sorts of events up until the 7th century. This can be seen due to the architectural elements present in the theater which show that it was used for three different periods. The Roman, the Christian and the early Islamic era. It was used as an Odeon. Odeon is the name for several ancient Greek and Roman buildings built for music. Singing, exercises, musical shows, poetry competitions and so on. There are passages and rooms beneath the theater seats where actors were stationed before their performance, where they could change clothes and also for the storage of their equipment. The theater at the time had all the elements to host perfect performances. A dome would have stood over the stage and it had a section for the orchestra as well. The audience section has a diameter of about 33 meters and has 13 rows made of European white marble. With the uppermost part being a portico made out of granite columns that were brought from Aswan. Some of them are still standing today. The rows were numbered with Roman digits and letters to regulate the seating of the audience. Despite this, there is still a discussion about the number of people it could hold. Some say it's 600, while there are others who say even 800 people would be able to sit in here. Even though it was used as an Odeon, it was mostly used for meetings of important figures and officials or for small private performances with a limited number of guests. Mostly in the Christian era, it was used as a conference hall for meetings. During the early Islamic period, it fell out of use and into neglect and would only be rediscovered during the middle of the 20th century. Today, it has become one of the most marvelous historical sites of the city. Considering Alexandria was claimed to have almost 400 theaters, it makes this one survivor even more precious. Next to the theater, we have the Auditoria and a colonnaded street, the only one in Egypt found until now. It clearly shows this was one of the more stylish and comfortable neighborhoods. As you take a relaxing stroll by these columns, turn right at the end to see the baths and go even further to arrive at the habitation quarter with the Villa of the Birds. And I'll see you guys there.
And here we are, at the final stop of the site. The Roman Villa of the Birds with its amazing mosaics. So, the villa dates back to the period of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, who ruled during the 2nd century AD. Other mosaic ornaments in the villa have different geometric motives, such as this Christian cross. Now, there is the base of a statue here as well, however, since we can see a Christian cross, it's probably a statue of the owners of the house. Since a statue of a god or goddess would make little sense in a Christian home. However, the villa seems to have suffered serious damage. Experts suspect it happened during the rebellion in the reign of Diocletian. Remember him? There was evidence of fire and the heat had damaged the mosaics. But it seemed the Roman owners made restoration to the villa afterwards. Since the damage was repaired, but archaeologists think it was done rather fast instead of good. Since they can still tell where these repairs were done. So the Roman owner, you may want to ask your coin back. Still, the villa is the most wonderful example of luxurious aristocratic houses built here during the Roman period. You can imagine many of these houses would have been here. It's incredibly lucky to see this one in. So it deserves a place among the most important monuments that were recently discovered in the city.